see a tombstone of my baby. A 15-year-old boy. 13-year-old. 8-year-old. Well, ages 6 and 9. Our community has been shattered by violence. Lives lost. Futures destroyed. Families shattered. We report on those stories all too often, but what we don't always hear is what it feels like for the officers who are tasked with finding killers and comforting families. We asked the Metropolitan Police Department to find us a cross section of officers who have sworn to protect and serve and work in every corner of D.C. Tonight, the six officers they chose and Chief Robert Conti shared their journey. As you join us in conversation with D.C. Police. Wonderful. How you doing? Good to see you, too. Good to see you, We met up last month at D.C. Police Headquarters to sit down with officers who find purpose in serving others. Hi. Foster, nice Wong. to meet you. We curated seven questions to ask each of them. You want it right here? What you're about to see and hear reflects a small part of our time together. Tell us what happened during your last shift, something that stayed with you. It was a good day today. Um, two days ago, I got a call for an unconscious baby, four months old. Um, we get there, dad's doing CPR, so I took over for that. Um, mom was really hysterical, she was really upset. So I said, hey mom, come help me. So as I'm giving chest compressions, she's giving her son air to help him breathe. So I can see his chest rising and so can mom. So just consistently giving him chest compressions, helping her give him air. And unfortunately, he did not make it. So just, you know, letting mom know, like, hey, this is what's going to happen. You have detectives that are going to ask you 21,000 questions, the same questions I asked you. So just prepare yourself for what I just asked you to hear it again. You know, like, you, know, you may get frustrated. You may not want to answer these questions again. But just to help her get through it and help dad get through it and just to let them know, like, hey, this is what's going to happen. You're going to have a lot of movement come in your apartment and we just need you to be ready for it. So that helps them. So by that happening just two days ago, do I remember that? Yes, because I have four children. So giving CPR to a four month old, it's tough, but you still have to help the parents to, through it. I see it on your face. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It stayed with you. It did. During my last tour, uh, I, I worked the uh, theft of a, of a motor vehicle, Barrett Row. Uh, when I arrived on scene, the, the owner of the vehicle, she was visibly uh, shaken, sad, and disturbed. Uh, we were able to get the information. Uh, we were able to track the vehicle's location. Uh, and the patrol is ready that we see things start to finish in terms of the report of the crime as well as closing it. Uh, well, in that case, we were able to track the location to a neighboring district and actually recover her vehicle. So I was able to drive her to her vehicle and get it back to her, her with, with, within the hour. She was uh, very appreciative and then overcome with, with, with joy and happiness. Her car was uh, unscathed, so it, it was it was nice to see uh, things from start to finish, and then it's you know kind of made by day. My last shift, what I remember is the uh, we actually had a, a series of robberies that happened uh, all back to back uh, in the early morning hours, uh, and I just remember responding up there and seeing the district commander and the officials take complete control of the situation. Uh, get their teams coordinated, uh, get everybody out there looking in the right places to, to try to combat uh, the robberies that were going on. We did manage to stop them, so uh, that was good. I do remember that. It was uh, a success. Uh, part of my last shift dealt with uh, dealing with the same robberies that we, the uh, captain mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, my unit, the special, uh, special liaison branch, uh, works very closely with the underserved communities here in the District of Columbia. Uh, we have numerous liaison units, Latino liaison, Asian, LGBT, deaf and hard of hearing, interfaith, and the African liaison unit. So I, I wanted to ensure that my Latino liaison unit was following up with the uh, victims of these crimes and ensuring that they get the proper uh, services and resources in reference to what happened. Because we like to be transparent, um, I also ensure that he he had an uh, interview with the media, so he was preparing for that as well. I guess the most, the most memor memorable part of my shift yesterday was um, walking around the Chinatown area on foot, um, but the most memorable part was when one of the business owners said thank you, which um, I honestly don't think that, it's not that it's rare, but it's, it really does touch me when they do say thank you and feel the appreciation from the community when they take the time to say thank you to us face to face and like build that rapport with the community and really get a feedback on what 
they truly went from us instead of um, just us responding to calls, um, being able to dig deeper and figure out what they would like to see from us and what we can do to improve. One of my favorite things about this job is dealing with mental health consumers. I know a lot of people don't, would rather not, but that's something that really interests me. So I dealt with um, this lady who suffered PTSD from being uh, sexually abused. Um, and she, you know, was suicidal. So I took her to the hospital and a lot of people didn't know that what triggers her is males. Like whether she hears a male, sees a male, anything, like she will, she just, you know, just got real shooken up, freaked out, start crying really bad. So um, I guess my favorite part about yesterday was just protecting her from as many males as I could, just to soothe her, you know, admit her into the hospital so she can get some help. Um, and just like, you know, trying to inform everybody like, hey, please only, you know, let females deal with her because it's gonna trigger her. I mean, I know she can't avoid males her whole life, but at least, you know, while, while I was with her, I was able to protect her from that for a little, for a couple of hours. My shift never ends. Um, it's the truth, it doesn't. Uh, whether it's two o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the morning, um, I'm just thinking back over the weekend from the start of the robberies that were occurring on Friday uh, to a 16-year-old young lady uh, who was shot uh, over the weekend um, to other shootings that we had over the weekend. Uh, the phone is constantly, uh, it's constantly ringing um, with bad things that are happening uh, to people in communities all across our, our city. So last year for me, uh, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a continuous shift, really, it is, and it, and it does not stop. Yeah, you all have such different days. You take an oath to, to serve and protect. So in this current climate, what does that feel like to you to serve and protect? I think it's something we all take very seriously. Um, you know, the chief often, often asks us why, why we serve, right? It's one of those big things to get us to think about why are we doing what we're doing? Uh, and I think that that answer is different for a lot of us, but I think most of us all started kind of with the same general um, desire to help other people. Um, I think that's the most basic uh, reason that a lot of us do it. So um, for me personally, my journey started that way, um, wanting to help others. Uh, and then it, it may sound um, kind of selfish, but I, I get a personal satisfaction uh, inside of me from knowing that I've helped somebody else through probably one of the most difficult times in their life, or it could be even something uh, very simple, <laughs> changing a, a tire on the side of the road or giving somebody directions. So there's a whole gamut, but um, I think for me, that's, that's the biggest reason is just helping people and, and the personal satisfaction that I get knowing that I did a good job and helping other people every day. Uh, as it relates to what it means to serve, it, it's a great honor. Uh, you know, this is, uh, you don't have to be here be an electrician or carpenter, anything. But uh, this is my chosen profession. Uh, and with that, I understand what it takes day in and day out. Um, some days are gonna be good, some days are not gonna be good. Uh, but that's the job. Uh, and as the captain said, being there uh, and with people in their darkest moments and being able to usher them through that, those times to better times, it's really what it's all about. Um, at the end of the day, I care. Uh, I wanna be good, I, I want to make a difference. It's not always about locking up bad guys and, and, and saving the world. That, that comes in time, but for me, it, it's, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. Uh, so one day, one interaction, if I can make someone's life that much better, then that's what it's about. You take that oath to serve and protect, so for you, what does that feel like? What does that mean? I think it's a calling, right? Because even on my days off, sometimes I prefer to be here at work, helping others, helping the communities ensuring that I made a difference at least for that one day, right? Um, ever since I was a kid, I wanted to become, to become a police officer. I grew up in New York watching NYPD with their uniforms, people respecting them, going from calls to calls. It's, it's an honor, right? Um, and like I said, it, it's a calling. You, you, it's gotta be in you, it's gotta be in your blood. Um, like I said, sometimes I'm on leave all my days off. I prefer to be here 
in this uniform serving the community? I feel like for me, um, when you hear protect and serve, you automatically think like, okay, I'm gonna save this person from this bad guy. I'm gonna help this lady across the street. Um, but I think it's way bigger than that. Like, we don't just protect and serve. We're people's friends, mentors, um, sometimes parents, brother, sister. Um, you know, we just have so many resources that a lot of the people in the community don't know about. Um, you know, that we have to fill in and be for them. Um, and I lost my train of thought. <laughs> but I just feel like, I feel like there's, there's way more responsibilities than just protect and serve that, you know, a lot of people don't know that we have to fill in. Like your last call? Yeah, like, I mean, that, that was protecting. I, I felt like that I was protecting her. Well, it's definitely about helping people. And if you can relate to people with certain calls, it definitely helps them out more, especially when it comes to domestics. Like some people never understand what they grow, go through until so you've actually walked a mile in their shoes. You know, a lot of people are judged when, you know, well, why didn't you leave? Or, well, can you do this on your own? And if you break it down to them, like you've been through it, it's easier for them to understand. Some family members try to rush that person, like, you need to go now, you need to leave. Some people may not have the finances to leave. Some people may not have somewhere else to go. So when people realize that you understand what they've been through and you can break it down to them almost like a science, it's so much easier for people to talk to you. So it's all about, you know, building that relationship. So I'll build on what she just said uh, with respect to uh, building relationships. I'm a firm believer in that. And for me, uh, in terms of service, um, before you can begin to really have partnership with people, uh, you have to have relationship first. And I think at the core of relationship is caring, which most of these officers here at their core, I believe that they care. A lot of police officers, as this officer mentioned, uh, you know, everybody doesn't, like, you don't have to be here, right? You could be retired, you could be an electrician, they could be doing all these other things, but because of this, this deep sense of caring for you know, our fellow human beings and wanting to help, whether it's to change the tire or you know, in a situation where you know, you're given a four-month-old CPR, you know, in your heart of heart, you care about people. And in my, through my lens, this is uh, one of the highest callings upon human beings, and that is to be in service and care for our fellow human beings. So really, care is at the, at the reason of service for me. So I think there's a responsibility not just to ourselves, but also to our coworkers, our family members, and to our community, and to never let go of the reason of why, like why did we join, and being able to wake up every single day and be grateful, and to be able to be, hold ourselves accountable and hold each other accountable, and how do we protect and serve the community the way that they need us to, and really build that relationship with the community to have them understand that we're human, we make mistakes, but every single day we can put our best foot forward and be able to do better than yesterday. We're going to talk about that humanity in just a moment, but I'd love for you all to ponder a bit about what you think is fueling the violence in the city. Um, if someone were to ask you that question. I think that when you talk about what fuels the violence, I don't think there's any one thing. I think that there are, are many things. Um, there are some people um, who just grew up or have, are growing up in a culture of violence where Violence is just the norm. This is how you resolve conflict. You have to be the most aggressive person in the group. Uh, you have to be the most aggressive person in the block. You have to be the most aggressive person on the subway. You have to be the most aggressive person in school. And there's a culture of violence um, that, that exists. And it's not just here in our nation's capital. We, we are seeing this all across the country, quite honestly. And that is probably one of the things that concerns me the most is that, you know, in some respects, some of these things are becoming normal, so to speak. Oh, well, it's just another 15-year-old with a gun. Like, that's not normal to me. It's another 
13 year old that tried to carjack somebody. That's not normal um, to me. But when we talk about the contributing factors, there's so many different things there. Uh, the fact that uh, some of our young people um, and some of our older people who were young once and still do not have the ability to resolve conflict. So what used to 10 years ago may have resulted in a fist fight. Now because of the presence of an illegal firearm, somebody has to die or somebody has to be shot. I watched a video just the other day of a, of a person. I mean, clearly these two individuals are known to each other. At some point there was a argument and a gun was pulled. I mean, shot the person like point blank. Like, how does that happen? Like, what were they, I mean, this, is, this was not an aggressive uh, dispute between, I mean, it was a simple argument that resulted in somebody uh, being shot. And when you see that really happening and you think about all the other compounding factors, when we talk about opportunity or lack thereof, when we talk about uh, some of the examples for our young men, uh, some of the examples that they have not seen, uh, present in their lives or the example that they have seen what does that example look like has it been abusive towards women has it been aggressive towards uh, other uh, people in community because of a disagreement uh, you know like what are the examples there so all of these compounding issues and you add to that right additional layers right so many of our young people now engage in the space of using marijuana and can't find employment opportunities. And then you talk about other family members or males of households being incarcerated or people being underemployed. So I wish there was just like this one thing and everybody could focus on just this one thing. Collectively as a community, we work on this one thing, but it's so many different pieces to this that really explains in my mind why we see the things that we see in community. I think he answered for all of us. <laughs> well, I, I think there, there will be some interesting perspectives too, though the chief gives one sort of overview about how this happens. But I wonder from, from all of your standpoints, because you're out on the streets as well, how might you answer that question? Is crime at the core of the calls that you're coming for or that you're called for? Is there something else behind it that leads to the crime? Can you just share Maybe a lot what of you, times also you these criminals, they prey on what they believe to be vulnerable victims, right, of crimes because they think that these victims are not going to report the crimes to the police, right? So we're here to tell the community, report the crimes, all right? Um, you, it's, it is safe to report the crimes with us. We are not going to ask any questions, for example, of like your immigration status, right? We strictly want to know what happened, but if you don't report the crimes, there's nothing we can do. So to piggyback off of um, Lieutenant Rodriguez, um, so I grew up in three different countries, um, and uh, most of my childhood was spent overseas. Coming from the Chinese community, I understand that um, in my culture, it is reasonable to keep everything internal and not ask for help from the government. Um, and having SLB and being an ALU affiliate, like I do feel like the responsibility to make the community understand, um, any underserved community, not just ALU, but um, being able to build that rapport to make them feel comfortable with asking MPD for help. But um, violence comes from many things, like the chief said. It could be from mental health issues. It could be from upbringing, just like culture in general throughout the country on how to be the toughest person out there and showing that through aggression and having that. There's no one solution, like the chief said. I really do think that it's from a ton of different angles, whether it's giving more services on mental health issues, um, like free therapy sessions, like how to communicate effectively without having to pull out an illegal firearm. and resolving into a homicide or injury. So it comes from many different places. I feel like the pandemic definitely spiked things up because, you know, there was just limited access to a lot of things. And then, you know, we couldn't really go outside and do anything that was like, I guess, fun or just stuff that interested us. So, you know, I feel like, especially the younger community got pretty bored. They got bored, they got tired of being without, not being able to do stuff. So it's like, 
not saying that this is an excuse for them, but it's like they just felt like, okay, well, we gotta find something to do. We gotta take things now, since it's not given to us. Um, I just feel like, I mean, it was always crime, but I just, I definitely feel like the pandemic helped spike things up. I would agree that there's no one answer. Uh, there's no one cause in terms of the, the violence that, that we're seeing in our streets today. However, I, I would say that um, a sense of community taking care of one another. I, I think that officers being in the community, that's one part of it. But that partnership with the community itself, the community taking ownership uh, and, and really going that extra step to ensure that their community, their neighborhood stays safe. Um, I remember as a small child growing up, I had aunties and uncles and family members and, and, and people in the community. If I did something wrong before I made it back home. My mother, my father, my grandparents knew about it. Today, I, I don't know if that necessarily, that culture, if, that, uh, if that's the presence in, in today's community. So uh, I would say that really getting, uh, getting involved, the community, the household, getting involved with the younger folks, the people in the community uh, to really curb the, the, the violence that we're seeing on the streets today. Officer Stevens? Um, I agree with what everybody else is saying. I do believe that it's a part of like, you know, their upbringing, um, peer pressure, um, lack of activities, maybe a lack of mentors. You know, um, if there were more things to do, they wouldn't think about the bad things to do. You know, grabbing a gun, shooting somebody or robbing somebody, you know, stealing from a store. You know, it's just, again, that community coming together you know, officers offering to help. So I think that would be a better way of doing things. But it's just, it's not just, you know, the parents trying to figure something out or the teachers or the school. It's just everybody coming together as one and putting a plan together to set up some activities, you know, once a week, do something different. You have some, some kids and some parents that shy away from it because, you know, living in a certain environment all they know is the wrong thing to do. And for them to step outside of that box is different. So sometimes that may be a challenge for some. It's a really good question. It's a very hard question to answer, right? I agree with my colleagues. I think those are all um, great reasons for why we're seeing it. But I think that one thing, maybe on a very basic level that we haven't mentioned yet, is just daily stress that people are going through, right? Um, People are dealing with, um, you know, like she mentioned, uh, the pandemic, right? People have lost jobs. People have lost uh, access to resources. They've had damaged relationships. They've had financial problems. And I think that all of those things, uh, without the, the proper outlets, uh, positive outlets, constructive outlets, have really kind of led folks to maybe do some things that they wouldn't normally do under normal circumstances, quote unquote, normal circumstances. Uh, and I do see that as one of the one of the, maybe the reasons contributing to uh, crime is just people's everyday stress in life um, and, and having needing those outlets that maybe aren't there for them. Officer Arlo, you kind of touched on this briefly. Maybe you want to take this, uh, give us the first answer to this question, but there's clearly a division uh, between police and communities throughout the country and here in the district as well. So how do you realistically build back that trust or build that trust between police and the community? It starts with each and every call for service. It's an opportunity to, to change hearts and minds, to win hearts and minds. Um, uh, and, the, and the first question you asked is, when you sat down with you today is, is tell me something uh, that you remember about your last tour. Uh, and I mentioned someone having their car stolen. And uh, I had an opportunity to spend a little over an hour with a group of uh, individuals. And, and I, I don't know what interactions they've had with police in the past, but we shared a dialogue, we, we talked, we, we bonded. Uh, you know, I asked for her support in, in, in trying to curb the, the auto theft issue. Put the stuff on social media. Uh, uh, you know, it, it needs to be a, uh, a team effort. Um, and at the end of it, we said, you know, is it okay to hug a police officer? I mean, absolutely, I'm a person, Just give me a hug. Uh, you know, so it's those interactions like that, uh, you know, hopefully they go back, they talk to their loved ones, their friends and family, they post it on social media, and that's, that's really where it starts. You know, you plant the seed and just watch it grow from there. So I, I, it's a matter of, of all of us uh, making sure that that's a part of what we do on a daily basis, not just answering the regular run, taking the report, or taking whatever police action is needed, but going the next step and really trying to, to bridge that gap on a daily basis. 
And that's what it's all about, right? Bridging the gap between the Metropolitan Police Department and the communities that we serve. Part of the Special Liaison Branch, we have three main functions, outreach, training, and resources, right? So with the out outreach, that's our primary function. Um, we try to establish long-lasting relationships with the communities that we serve. Our officers, they speak the language, they're they come from the same background, understand the cultures and their values, and that's a quality that we take pride in each and every day. Uh, we host numerous outreach events throughout the year. Coffee with a cop, um, fishing with a cop, you name it, skating, barbecuing, all right? Um, we also conduct <laughs> safety workshops. We're a little busy with all <laughs> yeah. that extra Seriously, stuff. Seriously, huh? fishing too. <laughs> uh, safety workshops, right, with business owners and other nonprofit organizations here in the District of Columbia. Um, and yeah, then there's uh, the training aspect of it is that we train our officers that may not be from a specific community, right? Understand the cultures and values through what? Uh, we do that through community engagement and cultural competency. Then we have the resources aspect of it. That is the, when our officers follow up with crime victims, they provide them with government and nonprofit uh, organizations, resources that citizens probably didn't know existed. Right, so we put them in contact with these agencies. Now the relationship, we build it, right? And we sustain that relationship by keep doing that each and every day. So <clears throat> through my lens, uh, as this officer mentioned, uh, I got a hug today too. And um, uh, it's funny you mentioned that because the lady, when she was speaking, and she said, you know, years ago, I would never have hugged a police officer. But I say that you know every opportunity that we encounter uh, community members is really a, an opportunity to make an impression. Every encounter, whether it's in traffic, whether it's you're going to a call, or you just happen to, you know, you know, as I engage people all across the city, Chief, can we take a selfie with you or something, right? I mean, I could be, you know, Mr. Krabby, no, right? And that'll certainly leave an impression on people, but just being able to engage people when they see that, you know, is something else behind the uniform, right? You're a dad or you're a mom or a leader in your church or your synagogue or in your community. Uh, people being able to just see you for who you are as a human being, like that, that means a lot to people. And I would also say that, you know, when I look at and I think about the 650,000 calls for service that we respond to every year, uh, each one of those opportunities, good, bad, or otherwise, for the reason that we are responding, we have an opportunity to leave an, an imprint on the person that we're engaging. If it's a, a crime victim and, you know, we make matters worse, shame on us. And we have to get better in that space, but we left an imprint on that person. If it's a crime victim and we are offering resources and giving them, talking to them about alternatives or driving them to their car so they didn't have to already have their car stolen and then catch an Uber to get to their car. The fact that the police officer took them, it's an opportunity to really make an impression on people. So I take those, those uh, opportunities very seriously uh, as I move about the city and really try to push that. Um, and impress that upon the members of the Metropolitan Police Department. Uh, I certainly believe that uh, when it comes to, to people, you have to model the behavior that you expect. So I want to treat people with the utmost professionalism and courtesy as I'm dealing with them and being very personable uh, with them so that you know our officers can see, well, wow, I mean, the chief can get hugs, I can get hugs too, and it's okay. Did we get everybody on that question? <laughs> um, I, would, I would say for me, consistency, I guess. Um, I remember one of my favorite little delinquents. <laughs> he, um, he, was just, he was just always running away from his grandmother's house. And, um, you know, everybody else just, just didn't want to deal with him. For some reason, I was just like, you know what? I, I want to know his story. Like why, like, why do you keep running away? Like, seriously. And one time I was transporting him back to his house and I just pulled over to the side. And I was like, you know, like, what's, like, what's going on? And he just like, he's, he was 12 at the time. And he just broke down. And he was just like, you know, I hate being at my grandma's house. My dad is locked up forever. My mom left me. And it was just like, okay, 
now, like, you know, now I get it. Like, he doesn't feel, you know, loved where he's at. So it's like now he, but I mean, the sad part about it was, you know, he, he runs out into the streets looking for love and that's unfortunate. But it was like, you know, every time he ran away, he would come to the police station. But, <laughs> but um, he also, I could tell he, he just wanted that attention. He wanted affection. So he would like get into it with the police officers just so they can, you know, give him attention. It was, it was like the craziest thing. Um, he would always like try to fight the male officers, but then it's just like, it's, it's always one male officer that say like, hey, look, like, like talk to him as if he was his dad and he'll just be like calm down. It's like, you know, that's what I needed. Like I need somebody to put me in my place. And um, you know, like they used to, every time they deal with him, they'll call me because I built a rapport with him. And it's like, he'll run from any other officer, but once he see me, he'd be like, oh. He was like, okay, I'm coming. And I'm like, yeah, because you know I'm going to chase you and I'm going to catch you. <laughs> um, but he, I don't know, that was just my favorite little guy. Even though things didn't turn out too good for him, um, you know, he just got deeper into the streets. But every time we did see each other, you know, I felt like I was somebody he can talk to and just like relieve a little bit of stress just by, you know, saying what was going on in his mind and how he was feeling. Yeah, so I think consistency would be something for me. And I also have a son, so it was, it was hard seeing him go through that, because I'm just like, please, please. I, I, like, if my son ever goes through this, like, I just wish there is an officer or somebody, like a, like a positive figure that will, you know, lead him in the right direction or just be there for him. Like, just be somebody he can talk to and vent to. I mean, it's, it's just about building relationships. And um, I had to go back to domestics because somebody gets a lot of those all the time. And coming from a person that has been through a domestic, it's easier to talk to somebody that has, that's currently going through it. So when you can talk to them like they're your sister and you know, tell them like, you have to do this. Let's do these avenues, let's try this. They can relate to you so much easier. They understand because you've been through it. Like I've been through it. So for me to talk to somebody else that's been through a domestic, to try to help them get out of that situation, they get it. I had a young lady that was going through a domestic and was terrified to leave. And I told her what I went through and the steps that I had to take and how hard it was for me to leave. But for the safety of me and my children, I had to make a hard decision. And I told her the same thing. You know, it's two choices for you. Either you can be judged by 12 or you can be carried by six. And I had to make a choice. And I told her, I was like, there's decisions you have to make. And when you can relate to them and they understand, they remember you. So it's just all about making them understand. When they feel that empathy from you and they understand that you get it, it's so much easier. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it really goes back down to why we protect and serve, like having, like remembering why we do what we do. And it's um, like everyone said so already, like it's, it's not just when we have interactions with the public, when we get a 911 call, a call for service. It's even getting out of the car and going across the street into the building, all those other people that we walk past and having that eye contact, um, hey, how's it going? Um, if, whether it's someone that you see on a regular basis, um, employees of the neighborhood that you, that you patrol, and just building that relationship day by day and interaction by interaction, every smile by smile, um, we just gotta keep persevering and really show the public that we are human beings, we have our own challenges just like everyone else, and being able to have that empathy and understanding with each other, holding not just the public accountable, but for us as well. And being able to understand why we each take our own different actions and the consequences that it might bring. Guess I'm the last one. Yep. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I grew, up with a, um, I grew up with a father who was a police officer and he's been a really good mentor and uh, a coach to me. And one of the things he taught me when I was a young officer on the police department uh, was that I should try to end every single interaction 
uh, that I have with somebody with them saying thank you. Uh, if I can guide myself in that direction, uh, then likely that, that interaction has been positive uh, and that person will walk away from that interaction having a positive outlook and feeling uh, based on their interaction with the police. And if each one of us can do that, that person will tell two more people and they'll tell four more people. Uh, and that's really how we kind of build our, our, our trust and reputation with the community. Uh, and I think that that's probably the key to um, bridging that gap between those who are still skeptical of, of the police. You know, they just see the uniform. Um, it doesn't matter what city they're from. They see the uniform and it's very difficult to um, remove or separate that person from the uniform. Um, and like everybody has said here, seeing the human that's behind the uniform, uh, I think if people can do that, um, we're working towards that. Uh, and I think that here on MPD, we're actually doing a really good job with that. I think our community really does, for the most part, uh, respect and, and look up to the, the police department. Um, and I can feel that when we, when we go out and interact with the public. That's a good thing. You set me up perfectly to ask this next question. And I think in the time that we've spent together here, we're getting a glimpse of who each of you are behind the badge. But if we were to ask you, you know, who are you behind the badge and how has that changed since you began serving? as metropolitan police officers and have risen through the ranks, what would you say? Who are you behind the badge? Well, I'm a, uh, I'm a husband, I'm a father, son, um, mentor to many inside of police departments all around the country and just plain old people who have absolutely nothing to do with law enforcement whatsoever. Um, I believe that one of the things that I've been blessed with is the ability to pour into other people, to help people to rise up and be better than what they think that they can do. And I've seen that play out time and time and time and time again in the various people that I've interacted and poured into. And um, that's who I am, you know, behind the uniform. You know, this is what I do. Uh, certainly a large part of my life, but I really enjoy pouring into other people so that they can be the best that they can be. And um, that's who I am behind the uniform. Behind the badge, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a sibling, I'm a son, uh, just like the chief. I was also once a natural bodybuilding competitor, which I left behind um, because of the job, right? It's so much goes into the bodybuilding world, um, it's like a 24-7 sport. Uh, I just couldn't deal with the eating, the training, uh, you know, change of schedules. It's, it was tough. Um, so that's who I am behind the badge. When I came on 15 years ago, I was a, a single guy living by myself in DC. I moved from <laughs> Iowa, uh, moved here, and things have really changed over that time. Um, Obviously, I've taken on more responsibilities um, with my career on the police department, uh, been exposed to a lot of great people, been mentored by a lot of great people, uh, mentored great people. Um, and um, I mean, behind the badge, we're real people, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of weird to talk about in this setting, but it's like, you know, we are. We're, now I'm a husband, now I'm a father, now I am a son, I have a sister, you know, we hang out with our families and, and go do things uh, not law enforcement related. I like to fly airplanes is one of my big hobbies. I like to go camping. Um, all the stuff that normal people like to do, go out, play sports, um, meet up with your friends and, you know, just have a good time. Guess I'll go. Uh, uh, as everyone said, I'm, 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 a, I'm a husband. I'm a, I'm a new father. Um, Congratulations. I, 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 the same person with the uniform as I am outside of the uniform. I think throughout my career, I started my career in policing uh, here in DC in the public housing uh, community. Uh, and I lateraled over here to the Metropolitan Police Department. I think throughout my career, uh, I've changed, I've evolved as, as, a, as a, not just as a police officer, but as, as a man, as a person, as a human being. Uh, seeing uh, what people go through on, on a daily basis, uh, being at the good times as well as the bad. It's made me a, a, better, a better man, a better brother, a better son, a uh, better husband. 
and now a better father. Uh, so ultimately, taking the experiences from work uh, and applying them uh, to my home life, raising my, my son and, and, and grooming him, raising him to be uh, better than me. You know, um, so as long as I do that, then my job is done. So, <laughs> behind this badge, I am a mom of three. I know it sounds shocking. I'm a mom, and I am also a football player. I play eight women's flag, five women's flag, all in D.C. Uh, we, we travel as well, too, and I now play um, pro for all women's team, Washington Prodigy. Um, and, yeah, I'm a quarterback, and I'm a wide receiver. Behind the badge, I'm a mom of four, three girls and a boy. Track mom, lacrosse mom. Um, I support my boyfriend with all his basketball games, so definitely a busy life. When I'm not in this uniform, I'm a mom. You know, I coach, help the kids get ready for school, take kids to school, pick them up from school. And then when I'm at work, I'm at work. And you just, you know, you just have to know how to balance everything out. My story is not that interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, behind the badge, I'm, I'm a daughter, friend. Um, I feel like personality-wise, I'm pretty much the same person with or without my uniform on. Um, I just try to be as supportive as possible. Um, spend most of my days at work, actually. Um, like Lieutenant Rodriguez said, like sometimes you love this job so much that you actually just want to be here, even if you're not. Um, so I spend most of my time here. So with that said, what's the most rewarding part of your job and what's the toughest part of your job? Personally, um, the toughest part of my job was when people don't take me seriously. I'm a female, I'm a minority, I'm really tiny. I'm five foot two, um, I have a bubbly personality. Um, being, I don't wanna say mean, but being aggressive definitely isn't my strong suit, but I make that, um, that con into my pro. Um, I use my personality to really build a rapport with people, um, to communicate with them, and to really get the information that I need to be able to do my job, and also with gaining compliance just in general. The most rewarding really is being able to see someone that I've supported um, in my career, be able to reach, see their potential and to get them to where they wanna go in life, um, whether it's on the department um, or not. Um, just being able to patrol like a certain area and seeing people thrive in their personal and their careers, um, that's honestly what I see as the most rewarding part. Um, being able to put this uniform on, uh, no two days are ever alike. Uh, being able to engage with people, seeing them in their, their, their darkest moments, as well as uh, their, their brightest, um, it's, it's an awesome feeling. Um, it, it definitely fills my, my tank inside in terms of what motivates me. At the same token, uh, because I do care so much, it's also uh, the biggest challenge because we, we, we can't stop all the crime. Uh, you know, we can't be there to, to save everyone. There's a four month old who was at CPR, you know, because we are people outside of the uniform, you know, we, we, we feel, we hurt, we smile, we laugh, we cry. Uh, so taking that home and not letting that change who we are as an individual, not allowing that to dull the, the light that, the, you know, that, that we portray. And um, it, it can be tough at times, but taking that and turning it to, uh, from a negative to a positive, using that as the motivation. Understanding we weren't able to save that, that, that child today, but there's one tomorrow. Uh, so keep going forward. The, the good thing is just, you know, being able to help people, you know, helping them understand, helping them see a different outlook on things. That's just the most important thing. If you can help that one person, then it's, you know, it makes your day a little bit better. But sometimes you have those calls for service where you may not be able to help that one person. You know, for example, like unconscious babies. 70 gets a lot of them. 
a lot. And you know, some of my coworkers would joke and call me the baby whisperer because I would get a lot of unconscious babies on a regular basis. You know, someone says, hey, Stevens, how do you do it? And it's just, it's just something that you have to do. You know, sometimes you do have to go talk to somebody because they, they want to see where you are mentally, especially when you do with things like that. So you have your good moments and then you have your bad moments. So you just have to learn how to separate yourself from it and how to overcome it. Because it's definitely tough at times, but you'll get through it, you know, talking to people and talking to a counselor and just having that good support system. So I think the most rewarding part for me um, is, you know, helping people that were, that are like how I used to be. For example, um, like teen moms, uh, teen moms that lived in shelters, in and out of shelters, in and out of this house, that house, with, with your kids, um, domestic violence victims, like um, just giving them, you know, hope and faith that, you know, this isn't, this isn't, this, it's not over. Like you can still be somebody, you can still, you know, change your life, do better for your kids, like, you know. I, um, I was lucky enough to have certain programs while I, while I was in high school, and it's just like, you know, I don't, I don't see those programs around anymore for people who were teen moms. Like, I had my kids 14 and 15, 15 and 16, actually, 15 and 16. And, um, you know, I, I, like, as I got older, I saw, like, you know, the age for teen parents got younger and younger, and it was just like, I wish these programs, you know, get into the schools before my kids get to this age, you know, like, um, or just even start earlier. Cause I didn't, I didn't get these into these programs until high school. So, you know, just giving, you know, people like me faith that, you know, you can be, you can still be something. Like the kids, the kids don't stop you. They may just redirect you, but they don't, stop you from, you know, being who you want to be. Um, the toughest part, um, like they said, you know, not being able to stop everything, not being able to protect everybody, serve everybody, um, especially like when we, you know, when we really do get the really bad guys and we see them tomorrow. <laughs> That's probably one of the toughest things and we're just like, you know, we, we thought we did enough. Um, but. With this job, it's just like, I, I learned that, you know, it's never really enough. Like, there's always more to do. Um, some, somebody's gonna love you, somebody's gonna hate you. It's, it's just, it is what it is. Honestly, I think the most rewarding for me, I got two. Uh, and, and the first one is that, um, like I said earlier, working, for, working towards that thank you, right? At the end of the day, leaving here knowing that you did something to, to help somebody and, and make them feel good, which also makes me feel good, right? And I leave, and that's one of the most uh, rewarding parts of this job, is leaving knowing that you actually did uh, help somebody. Uh, the second thing is just the opportunities uh, that we've had here. Um, we're involved in so many different special events that are on the world stage. Um, the sense of pride that you get for being involved in that, uh, knowing that you took part in a presidential inauguration or a motorcade movement or a, a, a funeral and uh, dignitary visits and those kinds of things are really rewarding to know that you're you're doing that on behalf of all of our our whole country right uh, here in DC and just kind of representing uh, everybody here in this country so it's really rewarding um, and then I think that the the most um, the difficult thing for me is detaching from work uh, when you go home, right? That's really difficult, especially when you do care. Um, not to take that, uh, I don't wanna really call it baggage, but to take that, that, that stress and anxiety and, and potential heartache and whatever else home to your family members who have also had a hard day at work, who now, you know, trying to protect from that. That's one of the most difficult things for me is finding that, that good work-life family balance, uh, I would say. Absolutely. I guess I'll start with my uh, the toughest one is just like the captain mentioned, it's just detaching from work, right? You take all this load, all this stress, and you can't just throw it away or set it aside. You have to take it with you. Um, that's one. And I think the second toughest is that 
just hearing that one of your own has lost a life, you know, due to mental health or something else, that is extremely tough uh, to hear about, especially when it's one of our own, right? Um, with that, I go with the most rewarding. Uh, most rewarding for me, I thrive on self-satisfaction, right? So to know that I made a difference in someone's life, that to me is everything. So I believe that's the most rewarding for me. And we hear from the community all the time. They praise us. We get great feedback from them. So that's my, the most rewarding for me. So the toughest uh, thing for me, um, now, there are a lot of things that are really tough when you're the chief. Um, but over 30 years, I've had a chance to move around in different spaces within this organization. And um, I just have a, I have a heart for, for victims, for survivors, for mothers who've lost their children, children that I've had to stand over. And I don't care how old they are, whether it's a 30-year-old child or a 10-year-old child or an 8-year-old child or Makaya Wilson who was 6 years old or uh, Chelsea Cromati back when I was in Homicide who was 8 years old. I mean it's just certain things that just like really really stick with you uh, in your in your career and when you have a heart for victims and you don't always see justice happening for them because of the system in part you know that 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 I'm I'm part of uh, that's very tough right when you know the guy who or you know who committed a homicide but in some instances I mean you get everything that you can but the two people who were standing in the block when the homicide happened refused to say because you know we don't snitch or you know we don't we don't do this so that person's life doesn't matter that's a that's a tough thing Right, to really deal with when, you've do, when you're doing everything that you can, but you don't see justice for, for victims of, of, of violent crime especially. So that's a tough thing for me. I got a few other tough things. I won't go into all of those, but I will tell you that the most rewarding thing for me is that uh, I am the chief of the Metropolitan Police Department in the nation's capital, the most powerful country in the world and I get to lead over 3,000 men and women who suit up every single day to come to this job, to come to this place, to come to this city. They come from all across the world and they come here trying to make a difference in the city where I was born and raised. And that is very rewarding for me to know that I lead men and women who could be doing other things, but they choose to put their life on the line every single day. Not because they have to, but because they want to. And it's just for a simple thank you sometimes. Just a simple thank you. It's not about money. It's not about anything other than, than you know, their tank being filled up because someone appreciates how they impacted their life. And I get to lead those amazing people. That's the most rewarding thing for me. Thank you for the gift of your time and, um, and your service every day. Thank we thank you. We thank you. We appreciate you. The conversation continues in the months ahead. We'll be speaking with other first responders, teachers, community activists, and leaders to talk about some of the issues plaguing our region. Conversations we hope will lead to solutions.